Good evening, my dear colleagues. Welcome to another Inget Zoom Serious Talk. Today, we have a very special guest. Uh, our guest is Associate Professor Dr. Nurdan Gürbüz. I said special because she has a special part in my heart. So <laughs> I know that this is going to be a wonderful talk. And we're going to learn a lot. Let me briefly introduce her <laughs> to you. I think she will also talk about her background briefly. Nuda Nojam is currently working at the Department of Foreign Language Education at the Middle East Technical University. Her wor work has been published in several scholarly journals. Her research interests include teaching conversational English, intercultural awareness in EIT and English as an international language. The title of her talk this evening is Current Views and Practices in Teaching the Spoken Language. Thank you, dear Nudana Jam, for being with us, for accepting to be a guest speaker. I'm leaving the screen to you. Thank you very much, uh, Aydan Hocam. This is a great pleasure. It's a great honor for me uh, to be uh, a speaker in Inget Zoom series. Aydan Hocam is a very special part in my heart as well. Okay, she is my most favorite teacher. She was, uh, she has been my actual instructor for four years um, when I was a student, undergraduate student at Gazi University. So. Right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for joining this se session. I hope it's going to be an enjoyable session and there'll be some um, food for thought to take away at the end of the session for all of us. OK, so I can share my screen. Right. So I guess everybody can see the screen. Any problem? Okay, the title of my talk is Current Views and Practices in Teaching the Spoken Language. Before I start, I can briefly probably uh, tell you a little bit about me. As Aydın Hocam uh, already mentioned, okay, my alma mater is Gazi University, where I learned all about how to teach English. Um, about methodology, practice teaching, and I had wonderful instructors. I don't know, John was with me, as I said before, for four years. And after that, I started working right after my graduation at Middle East Technical University um, for a very long time. So I'm not going to give you the date in order not to reveal my age, but it has been a long time. Okay, as Jamil Ma says, you see, I was there, so they just built over the building <laughs> over me. Okay, and after that, I did my PhD after my MA um, study. I did my PhD at the University of Nottingham, and I've been working in METI, in English language teaching department um, since then, right? Okay, a little bit about my research interests. I think about all of among all of these, what I love to think, read, and um, sort of analyze is basically everyday conversation. I love to think a lot about how people speak, why do they say the things they do, and uh, of course, most importantly, how can I teach spoken language to my students? Um, apart from that, I'm interested in well. Okay. Conversational English still related to spoken language and especially fluency, disfluency, and um, a couple of other things regarding the teaching of spoken language as well. And I also like to step out a little bit, try to see the big, big picture um, from, you know, where I'm teaching English, because English given uh, several labels. It's an international language. It's a global language. So I'm also interested, you know, in the concept of English as an inter international language and intercultural issues. And of course, undoubtedly, I'm an English language teacher educator. So I'm very much interested in teacher education as well. 
Right, so <clears throat> before we start, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the content of this talk. So um, I'll start with the understanding the change. In other words, what it means to teach English these days. Um, I feel people of my generation is in a in a good place to compare the two. What um, it meant to teach English about 30, 30 plus years ago when I was an undergraduate student and how things have changed now. And regarding the spoken language, I'll talk a little bit about what it is that we teach um, when we teach the spoken language. Uh, I think we've got people trying to come in, right? And nature of spoken language, uh, willingness to communicate, learner engagement, speaking anxiety, assessment of speaking skill, effective feedback, and how to deal with some of with some of these challenges. So it looks like I'll be talking a little bit about all the things regarding the spoken language. So little, little in the middle of job. <laughs> right. So why did I pick this topic uh, for this talk? As I said before, I really like to uh, do research uh, about spoken language teaching spoken language. It, it also started uh, when I started doing my PhD um, at the University of Nottingham. Nottingham has a very good school for you know, doing research on spoken discourse. And my PhD thesis was related to it. Apart from that, of course, <clears throat> the second reason is, I think teaching the spoken language is always a challenge together with many other components of language. And um, so basically these are the two reasons why I wanted to um, talk about uh, how to teach uh, speaking today. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what has changed, okay? And what do we do actually, or what are we expected to do when we teach English? and we teach the spoken language. First of all, I think I was an undergraduate student during the heyday of communicative language teaching. Would that be right to say, Hoja? Okay. So we were always busy with thinking about what is communicative competence? What it involves? How do we teach language in a communicative way? I think that's still, um, I mean, something that we focus on but apart from, I think we added other components to communicative competence, okay? Uh, it's being interactional communicative competence, intercultural competence, and probably many other things we have added to it as well. And uh, because of the status of the English language in the world, uh, which is basically caused by the number of the people speaking it, we also started talking about World Englishes, because as of um, 2022, the number of people uh, speaking English, according to the figures last year, it was about 1.5 billion people speaking English. And only one fifth of this number is native speakers of English. Okay, that means most of the people in the world who speak English, who use English, who communicate in this language are actually non-native speakers of English. Okay, this being so, uh, it also changed the way we look at how we should teach English and how we should teach the spoken language, basically. And needless to say, a lot of things you know, have changed regarding the technology as well. And people have become more mobile in a variety of senses, okay? And we have become more flexible in terms of how we learn, what we learn, and also uh, regarding the different modes of education as we experienced in the last few years, right? We have seen traditional way of sort of uh, teaching, I mean, education, in-person education, um, emergency remote teaching, 
distance education and eventually this semester, you know, hybrid, which is, I think, among all, was the most tiring for me, right? Okay. Um, I think I talked about the number of the people speaking English. So we hear a little lingua franca communication. Okay, what does that mean? So many dialogues, many communication among people whose native tongue is not English, right? So what does that uh, mean for us? Okay, in 2004, Seidelhofer said a lingua franca has no native speakers. So English being a lingua franca, let me say one of the lingua francas, most pervasive ones. So English has no native speakers. That's a very strong claim. And it was about 19 years ago, Seidelhofer said that. And since then, I'm sure many things have changed as well. And according to Gradel, Native speakers may feel the language belongs to them, but it's actually those people who speak it as a second or foreign language will determine its world future, okay, who are going to have an impact on the language. My observation, you see, thinking about people speaking English all over the world, reading about them, doing a bit of research, okay, in my own little corner of the world. What was, has been this, I think in any um, ALF exchange, okay, lingua franca exchange, we can see the impact of at least three languages and three cultures. Why do I say at least three? Because suppose I'm Turkish, I'm speaking to an Italian person in English, I might know other languages which might uh, very much affect the nature of the conversation or nature of the communication that I'm going to be, you know, in with a particular person. So what do I mean by the impact of, you know, three languages, three cultures? I think, I mean, needless to say, we are very much under the influence of our own native language and culture and the language we study and we communicate. And the same thing is true for the other party as well. So this being so, sometimes these things get a little bit complicated and people start communicating. For example, if I ask you, what could be some Turkish specific conversational strategies transferred to dialogues in English? I'm sure you could think of a couple of things, right? For example, when we think about conversational behaviors, probably it's a cultural thing to um, tolerate interruptions and overlapping speech when we talk to people in Turkey. And you might also agree that this is the case when we speak in English with other people, okay? In whose uh, native culture and language, this sort of thing might not be might not be really tolerated, right? Okay, so we said there are so many people speaking English as a non-native language. So what happens when everybody speaks English, quote unquote, in their own way? Okay, so the first image, the the first emoji is a relief. Hey, great. Okay, I can speak English in my own way. So what does that mean? When I was a very young research assistant, more than 30 years ago, I was at a conference um, at Chukurova University. And right after the conference, you know, a couple of instructors, professors, they were talking among themselves. And one of them said, of course, when I speak English, I'll have my Turkish accent. What do you expect? And we were, you know, sitting there, and we say, hey, that's the novelty. I never thought about it that way because we always felt, you see, how can we speak English that great? We had that, you know, native speaker fallacy, that um, idealistic sort of, you know, very impossible, uh, how can I say, image, yeah, idea of speaking, let's say, as, uh, as well as a native speaker. 
again, uh, joke comes to my mind. I'm going to speak Chinese so well that there won't be any difference between me and the Chinese person. I think I never, I don't know, John knows what I'm talking about. Okay. And um, so Jamil Ba says, why don't you be a tourist? Okay, be a learner. So set your ideal, you know, set your goal, probably at a more realistic level. Okay. So the first thing was relief, right? I'm Turkish. I can speak to English with my Turkish accent. Okay, and we know that accent is not the only feature of language. There are, of course, many other things transferred to another language when you speak it. And the next thing is, of course, challenges, right? What does that mean? So why it's the challenging thing? Um, as you know, in the world, it is very common for certain companies, many companies to outsource people. For example, you could be a tourist in the United States. You could be making a phone call, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, let's say you're going to book your ticket or something. A person in another country might answer the phone and help you. So let's suppose this person has very thick, if this person is Turkish, let's say very thick Turkish accent, combined also by one of very thick local accents. Okay, let's say a very thick Turkish accent combined with a very thick New York accent, okay, for somebody who isn't really familiar with any of these accents. So in such cases, communication get, gets a little bit challenging. That's why um, our, I think, lifesaver is, what is it? Intelligibility. So we say, what is most important when we teach English? If I can understand the speaker, if their message is clear to me, that's fine. I have to, of course, insert a comment here. People like me who are working in an English language teaching department, we have to think about other things as well, okay? But I would still say, initially, in order to encourage your students, this could be a very good um, point to start, if you know what I mean. Okay, so let's make sure your English is clear, people can follow you, and then we can talk about the other things later on. So when we think about pace of life and communication nowadays, um, things happen very quickly, right? So people have to be, people have to communicate very effectively in a very short time, and this should sort of fluency, intelligibility, I think um, because of this, it, it's, uh, I mean, they gain a lot of importance. Um, <clears throat> here, I would like to make a comment on what Firth had said in 1966. According to Firth, um, talking about lingua franca communication, people who is, uh, native tongue is not in English. This, um, he says, they have a tendency to uh, agree with one another, okay? Because their conversation is mainly very consensus oriented, very cooperative, and mutually supportive, okay? These are his expressions. And when you don't understand something, you just smile and nod your head. And this is what he calls the let it pass principle. Okay, what does that mean? This is the case in interactional discourse. I guess we should make a distinction between interactional discourse and transactional discourse. Okay, if two people you know, meet on the train and they start talking to each other, so what is the purpose of this conversation? Because they are just, you know, being friendly. They just want to talk to one another for no particular reason, apart from, you know, sort of running the social wheels. So in such cases, I think let it pass principle would be sort of very active. So if you don't understand something, you would go right here, right? So how was your flight? You know, Actually, I was asking a question, but never mind. Okay, so this is 
very much tolerated. This was also my observation when I saw people communicating with one another. But the problem is in transactional discourse, right? When you get something done, if you don't understand the other party, if you are, let's say you ordered some food and you had the wrong food in the restaurant, or you have no idea what the waiter is talking about, then you've got a lot of problems. Right, so um, after setting the scene a little bit about what has changed and what should be the focus um, of, let's say, um, not focus, but what are the things that we should take into consideration when we teach uh, spoken English? Uh, I would like to start talking about the heart <laughs> of the topic, which is related to, you say, to my title, nature of spoken language, okay? So why teaching, uh, why is it so complicated or why is it so complex? Why is it so challenging? Probably because of several things. First of all, when you teach speaking, you teach a lot of things you deal with many things. There is the listening part. There is the pronunciation part, okay? And when I say pronunciation, pronunciation in this sort of, you know, in a bigger sense of the world, covering everything, prosody, rhythm, melody, um, intonation, stress, and many other things, accent as well, okay? And uh, apart from that, there are, of course, other things, other constructs. I, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about one of them in a minute, uh, like fluency, for example. And the other thing is, um, well, you, there is a lexical component. There, there are structural issues and uh, there is linking the chunks of language, lexical bundles, idiomatic expressions. So all of these are components of spoken language. And when we think about everyday conversation, there are also other things that we should think about, okay? How everyday conversation works. When you listen to people or when you speak in your native language, basically you don't understand how simple, how easy, then again, how complicated, how chaotic everyday conversation is. So there is usually an order in the midst of a chaos, which is very much culture and context shaped. So somebody out of that culture, out of that con context, have no idea what these two people are talking about. And then there, there is conversational dynamics, topic change, topic initiation, topic management, turn-taking, interruptions, overlapping speech, silence. How long should the silence be? Okay, I think in most cultures in the world, any silence of more than a couple of minutes would be, would be very tense, okay? It would be very uncomfortable. How about in Turkey, in other uh, countries, or in English speaking countries? There, there, there could be some differences. And how culture shapes the conversation and conversational behaviors. So all of these, I think when we teach how to speak in a foreign language to our students, we have to deal with these, okay? Uh, one way of doing that is to turn to corpus research. How can you do that? I think it could be a good idea to um, read or do some research about corpus findings, corpus research findings. You might say, how am I going to do that? Some of the corpora, um, I think you can have access to some of the corpora, you know, via ba uh, basically just by means of registering for it. There is the British National Corpus, there is COCA, there is North American sort of spoken English and many others as well. But if you say, I don't wanna do that, I would strongly recommend you to have, a, I don't know if you can see the title, right? Looking at a piece of conversation, right? What is it? When I was teaching methodology about 10, 15 years ago, so, that week, I was going to teach 
uh, how to teach speaking to my students. I said, why don't you walk around the campus and talk to people by taking their permission, tell them you're, you're going to record their conversation in Turkish, okay? And then bring them to me so that we can talk about it. If possible, do your own transcription. This is one of those uh, actually data um, recorded and transcribed by one of my students called Filiz Akış. I'm sure Filiz is a very successful English language teacher somewhere on the country. And if she ever watches this program, I mean, uh, this YouTube video, Inget video, she should know that I'm grateful to her because um, I have used this several times uh, in, my, um, in my lectures. I think this is a great way of understanding how spoken language works. You might, you might say, why are you doing, doing this in Turkish? Because initially, it might be easier to understand the conversational dynamics, to infer the meanings, or to see what is going on in this conversation. For example, at the beginning of this dialogue, this is all in Turkish. I'm sorry we had, an, we had a speaker. Uh, from another country, so I'm not going to go through this. We don't have time for it either. It starts with a question, bardan var mı? Ah, oh, bardan rengi çok güzelmiş. Have you got a mug? Oh, the color is very nice. The funny thing is, you don't get an answer to this question, okay, until, you know, in, in two or three minutes. And nobody says, hey, I asked you a bloody question and why don't you answer it, okay? Because because there are many other things that come in between and nobody's worried about that, right? Okay, so one way of uh, giving a chance to your students to uh, understand how spoken language works is to turn to conversations in Turkish, conversations in English or in any other language that they are more familiar with. As I said a couple of minutes ago, so one of the components of spoken language is, of course, fluency. Fluency on its own is a very complex uh, construct, okay? There are many different components of fluency itself. Uh, McCarthy says fluency is something in conversation that the speakers co-construct, okay? The agreement, the back channel markers, the way you follow your speaker and all that. And other people, okay, focuses, they focus on, for example, temporal variables in um, influence. What does that mean? Somebody defines, I think it was Lourdes, defines, yes, the uh, fluency as the length of fluent runs between pauses. If the fluent runs are longer than your fluent, if they are shorter than the pauses, then you are disfluent, okay? But fluency is also related to lexical items. Your very knowledge. Fluency is also related to your structural knowledge. And there are also phonological issues regarding fluency. And on top of these, there are psychological issues related to fluency. So this paper, this was my personal project. I worked on this for three years. And I just wanted to see what are the indicators of fluency and what are the indicators of disfluency and what could be the reason for, for these. So if anybody is interested in it, then I'd like to have a look at that. Uh, I talked a little bit about the uh, oops, uh, features of spoken language, right? Nature of spoken language. So everyday conversation is a little bit messy. It's a little bit disorganized. But as I said before, there is a wonderful order um, in the middle of this you know, big chaos. One of them is, for example, repetitions. So I'm sure you're familiar with this comic, okay? A bunch of guys sitting around the table and they all um, talk about how much they have eaten by using different phrases. Yalnız bayağı yedik ama iyi yedik fakat ne yedik be. And at the end of it, the waiter, you know, goes like, it's a lot of your and blah, blah, whatever it is. So 
we laugh at this, but this happens all the time, you know, in everyday conversation. So you, you have, you know, um, many repetitions and nobody says, so you watch a film with your friend, you say, I really liked the film. The film was great, but it was really good, wasn't it? And nobody says, why are you repeating what I said by using, you know, other vocabulary items? Because that sort of thing happens in spoken language. Okay. Um, if you want, to, if for those of you who are interested in learning more about how spoken language works, um, so McCarthy and Carter paper on spoken grammar, how spoken language has its own grammar is a very good one. There is also a very good YouTube video on this. So if you prefer to watch the video, and uh, the other one is David Crystal interview, also David Crystal's books about let's talk how English conversation works. I use uh, some of these as my as part of my course content, okay, to motivate the students or to you know get them prepared for their future courses and future content, whatever it is that they're gonna do in the department. Right, so uh, we talked about the nature of spoken language and a couple of other things related to it. Another thing that comes up in literature very frequently these days is um, willingness to communicate, learner engagement, okay? This is very important for speaking classes, isn't it? Because one of the biggest challenges is to get the students to talk. I've got many students whose voice I would never hear unless I gave them a task, like a mini role play or a mini talk or a mini presentation. And at the end of which I would most of the time um, pleasantly surprised, okay, because their English would be lovely, their ideas would be great. But then again, they would just prefer to keep quiet. And why? What is the reason for that, right? We'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of minutes too. So re uh, related to willingness to communicate, we have learner motivation, especially focusing on individual differences and the dynamic nature of um, learner motivation. So if you're familiar with Dernier's and uh, his team's research, okay, may he rest in peace. He was a very productive, very prolific scholar. Um, so directed motivational currents, flows, and uh, th there's a lot of research going on, okay, regarding this uh, matter, right? And some of these we can, of course, relate to spoken language or teaching speaking as well, or learning the spoken language as well. Right, we talked about willingness to communicate. Um, also in literature, I'm sure recently you came across a lot of research studies regarding teacher cognition, teacher beliefs and teacher attitudes. So we also, I think need some research on learner cognition, right? Learner beliefs and learner attitudes regarding, regarding students' um, unwillingness to communicate. Usually the reason is most students, I would say, if not all, would have speaking anxiety, okay? That would be the reason why they wouldn't like to speak, okay? In our research paper, we realized that most of the students perceive speaking skill as an anxiety provoking factor. And the reason being pronunciation, immediate questions coming from the teacher, fear of making mistakes, negative evaluation. So these sort of being the major cause of speaking anxiety. So, as you know, Horwitz have a lot of research, has a lot of research on speaking anxiety. So there is indeed something called foreign language speaking, speaking anxiety, right? And there is also public speaking anxiety. We all know what it is all about. 
and we might be experiencing it to a certain degree because when we speak in front of a public, we want to leave a good impression on them, right? And all of this, these could create some sort of anxiety. So foreign language speaking anxiety combined with public speaking anxiety and shyness, unwillingness to communicate on top of this. So we do have a very, very challenging job in order to, I mean, in terms of encouraging our learners to speak. And the thing is, there are many reasons, several reasons why people would have speaking anxiety in a foreign language or public speaking anxiety. My suggestion at this point uh, would be this, as somebody who has spent a lot of time on teaching uh, speaking and doing some research about it, I think too much introspection is not good. Thinking about why do I feel like this? Why is it, How, what is the reason for it? Instead of that, we should encourage our students to focus on what they can do to um, overcome this sort of anxiety, right? And I would have a couple of suggestions about that. I don't know how I'm doing in terms of time, Hojam. I hope I'm okay. I've got a couple of other things to talk about as well. Thank you. Right, so building a speaking confidence. Um, at this point, I'd like to share some of my um, practices, experiences, what I do with my students. First of all, I do that through course content. And what I mean by course content, I'm going to share with you, you know, in a couple of seconds. And the second thing is, I try to do that through assessment through a variety of tasks and as many tasks as possible throughout the term. And finally, effective feedback. So let's have a look at each of these to see what I really mean by them, right? So course content for me, it means two things. The first thing is all the things that I do with the students, like assigning them articles, you know, book chapters to read, videos to watch. Um, yeah, so related to their subject matter. So what they do in the department, okay? So my first year students, I mean, the first year students that I teach, they are already familiar with Chomsky, David Crystal, Krashen, Deborah Tennant, Michael McCarthy, a couple of other people who are big names in the field and who had a lot of you know, con great contributions to our field. So when they start studying these, they sort of say, great, I'm already familiar with this. I read about this. I watched you know, this video about this. And that sort of famil familiarity motivates the students because it provides them some content to speak and to talk about, especially if they are very motivated to study in our department. Um, right, so this is a great book, just the phrase I'm going through, My Life in Language by David Crystal, which is actually um, an auto autobiography, but also a great um, introduction to linguistics and language as a system. So for those of you who are interested in that, that would be a good piece of reading. And the second thing I do is I do both of these uh, simultaneously. So each week there would be some motivational content and there would also be content related to their area of, you know, their future area of uh, expertise. So we've got a lot of encouraging motivational videos, songs, for example, gonna be okay. Or a book, Fez Auja would be very familiar with. Fez Auja is a pod, radio podcast. And uh, in a couple of them, she talks a lot about this book. I think people of my generation, uh, some of them at least would be familiar with this book. So this book has great content to encourage students to talk in the classroom, especially if they suffer from speaking anxiety. And we've got songs, music, um, films to watch, 
and uh, so also some self-awareness sort of raising sort of videos. For example, this particular video, the labels we carry make students very touchy, so they respond to it, although they would suffer from possibly, you know, some sort of speaking anxiety, they still want to talk about it because the content is so interesting. It's about, you know, people going around and each time sticking a label to you, okay, like ugly or slim or overweight or crazy, whatever it is. At the end of the session, one of the students, she, he just put a piece of paper on my desk and he wrote a couple of adjectives that he had written for me. One of them I thought was uh, so special. He had written relatable. So that means whatever I talk about in the course, somehow, you know, the student, at least that particular student thinks it's relevant, okay, in terms of either encourage him, encouraging him to speak or to be motivated more in the, in the, in the course. Okay, so another video that students like very much is, it's a, it's a TED uh, video in YouTube called uh, Learning a Language, Speak It As If You Are Playing a Video Game, right? In which the students are, learners are encouraged to use the language as a tool. So get whatever it is that it is expected from them without being very fussy about it. Because after all, when you play a video game, what it is that you're interested in, right? To play the game and to communicate in English while doing so. So this lady in Malaysia goes to a pharmacy. She needs omega pills. And there are so many of them, she says. She doesn't know which one to buy. She goes to the person working there and she says, oh, the person tries to speak accurately, okay? And a variety of probably vocabulary items talks about this one, talks about that one. But I can, I can sense her anxiety because I'm a native speaker and this person is tense about it. So in the end, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. Then there is another one. The speaker goes, this one is for heart. This one is for mind. Heart, okay? Yes. Then take this one. And that's it. Okay. So what she was talking about was, I thought, so, so valuable. If you're so self-involved about getting things, you know, and accurate and being very fussy and sensitive about this and that, you probably fail because you take yourself too seriously. At the end of the day, it's all about what you communicate to the other party. So if you're interested in motivating students to speak or to get rid of their anxiety, this uh, video has very good content. So I like my topic so much that I forgot to get anxious. As I was giving feedback to my, one of my students only two days ago in the department, so when I give feedback, the first question is, I'm sure most of you do the same. So how was it? What did you think about it yourself? He said, Hocam, konumu o kadar çok sevdim ki heyecanlanmayı bile unuttum. I like my topic so much that I forgot to get anxious. I thought, this is great, okay? Because this is what we want to do. Language, after all, is a means to communicate whatever it is that you want to, to the other party. Right, so assessment, assessment in spoken language, it's a bit tricky, isn't it? So we want to be objective and we want to look at all the components of the language as much as possible. I think it is a wonderful thing to start with diagnostic tasks at the very beginning of the semester but also very challenging, also very time consuming. I usually have more than a hundred students, three groups of students whom I teach uh, speaking, oral communication, listening and speaking, public speaking. And think about, uh, think about going through all the recordings. I usually give them one or two questions and I say, why don't you 
uh, record your answers and upload them to what we call, you know, to Moodle or to class. And I go through each one of them and I give them feedback either in Zoom or in person. I think they have a right to get very detailed feedback, whatever task they are asked to do, you know, by their teacher. So when people say, oh, you're teaching speaking, you don't have many papers to <laughs> mark. Well, <laughs> I have other things to do, right? Which is also more challenging. And the other thing is to give the students a variety of tasks among which they can have a say, they can choose, especially if you want them to uh, get rid of their shyness and their anxiety at the beginning of the semester. If they want to recite a piece of poem or sing a song or do something else, I think they should be given options. After all, we're not always good at everything, are we? And the other thing is flexibility. What does flexibility mean for me? Um, basically, uh, the students picking their own content when they want to uh, give an inspiring talk or an academic presentation. But well, you do have some crazy topics, but I usually tell them to send me emails uh, before, I mean, in advance, so that you wouldn't pick something that only you are interested. So if you're going to talk about how to play football in eight or 10 minutes, I'm sure nobody would be interested in it because most of it is encyclopedic knowledge. You'd look it up and you read it and you're not really bothered about you know, listening to it. And again, options in graded tasks so that they can pick one and do it. Detailed rubrics, I try to work with more than one rubric. I've got a more holistic one and a very detailed one, and I try to combine them at the end of the semester. And the last one is, um, it is very challenging, but I believe that if a student didn't do that great, great, sorry, in one of, one of the tasks, I always tell the students, would you like to do it again? And if the student agrees, I'm very happy. I can have extra sessions. I can spend many more hours as long as they are willing to improve or try it again. Because although you give everybody this chance, not everybody does that. Many students would go, I don't want to do it again. That's too much trouble. Why don't you create this one? Then I would be OK with it. I know that my context could be different um, compared to yours. You might probably have many students, and it might be hard for you to give everybody um, individual feedback or to give people chances to repeat the tasks that they're going to do all the time. But as much as possible, if you are willing to do that, students benefit a lot from that. At least that was my experience. And then comes feedback, right? what we call sandwich feedback or feedback sandwich. Um, I think it is very valuable. I mean, it's very useful and significant for the students to get individual and detailed feedback from their instructors. Usually, you know, it starts with something like, so what do you think about it? How was your talk? And you wouldn't believe the things that they would say. Most of the time, students would be extremely judgmental, very strict, and very harsh on what they have done in the classroom, okay? And uh, so encouraging, giving them some sort of um, encouraging sort of, how can I say, more constructive things um, to make them believe that they can do better next time is, I think, very important. So we always talk about feedback being feedback should be constructive, we say. So what do we really mean by a constructive feedback? How are you going to make it constructive? So probably you'll leave the student in such a state and the student goes, so was I good or not? <laughs> Which is, um, you know, something they can, they can question, right? So start with something that went great and squeeze in between 
an area to improve and eventually uh, you know, finish off again on a positive note. And most of the time, students are a lot better than they really think they are. This is um, this was one of the things I have noticed. And uh, in the speaking courses, as much as possible, I try to integrate different types of feedback. So they have individual feedback from me, peer feedback, both oral and written, and group feedback. And eventually, they have a self-assessment for each task. And I'm grading all of these so that they can take it seriously and they can write it in a detailed way. Otherwise, my friend was great. I really liked his or her talk, and that's it. Of course, they need a bit of training, a very brief training, and detailed rubrics about the things that they should pay attention to. So oh, um, at this point, I've been talking a lot. I'll just take a breath for a couple of probably minutes. At this point, I'd like to ask you what worked best in your setting, both, I mean, either as a language learner or as a language teacher. Why don't I share this Padlet link so that you can type in your ideas. I guess we would have a couple of minutes for that. I don't know, John. Right, okay. So, um, for, can you see my screen? For those of you um, who haven't tried it, I'm sure you're familiar with it, just click the plus sign and type in your message, whatever it is you want to write, and pick publish. So let's see what works best in your setting when you teach speaking. Nurdan Hocam, maybe you can share as text because it's appeared as image. So it's not easy to uh, find the link. All right. OK. Um, let me just. Darkan Hocam, I can see the uh, link in the chat box. Yeah, the, the, the link is the, in the chat box. Uh, all right, Nurdan okay. Hocam, uh, it, it, that is the link. About right? it, it's okay. Th ah, thank okay. you, thank yeah. you, Adam Hocam. Oh, yeah, no, Start you're too, all about So welcome. the upper part is working. Yeah. Because I can see people writing. It, it yeah. looks like people are typing things. Mm -hmm. Three people are typing. Four people are typing, but nothing is coming out. <laughs> Not yet. Now only two people are typing. Pet dogs, right, okay. I guess in most settings, uh, they, they would work. They have great content, content don't they? Role plays. They are lifesavers, right? They are interactional. They are brief. YouTube videos, mostly heartwarming ones, yes. Those motivational, encouraging ones. Again, another person wrote role plays. Teaching through textbooks. Okay. And uh, right. Uh, please. Pick the link in the chat box that will take you to the uh, to this site, and then you can type it there, okay? And then you can come back. Modeling, teacher, video songs, daily conversational speeches, all very great ideas. Having items on some fixed expressions and teaching them to the students, right? Video creation for short presentations. That's very useful. Wonderful, wonderful suggestions. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, I don't know, John. I'm going to finish uh, now. I'm just going to wrap up because I know I've been talking, talking a lot, and I don't want to uh, sort of take the time for questions and comments, right? Okay. 
Well, well you, have managed, you have managed this time perfectly. Thank you very so, much. Richard. No worries about that. Thank okay. you very much for this wonderful talk. Uh, of mm. course, I know that uh, it is very hard to put everything uh, in an hour. I know, especially when you're <laughs> talking about spoken language. Right. Uh, so let's wrap it up and then we will ask okay. the participants if they have any questions or not. Right. Instead of going through all these things that I mentioned, I just like to leave it here as a slide because I know that the video is going to be in YouTube anyway. Uh -huh. So I guess the most important thing is we turn to nature and the nature is so patient. We should be patient and supportive with our students. And eventually, this is something that I repeat probably in many places. I think our jobs as language uh, teachers is very significant because we don't only teach a language and its culture or about other cultures, but we actually help people to improve communication across the globe. So that's why whether you teach speaking or writing, it doesn't matter. So it just requires a little of dedication because teaching is a work of heart, okay? Apart from being a, a work of art. So I'm gonna leave my references here as well. As I said before, they're gonna be in YouTube. Thank you very Thank much you. for your patience. Wow. Thanks a lot for listening to me. I hope I didn't Thank talk Thank you too very much. much. Thank you. No, of course not. Well, uh, of course, when you were giving your talk, we were uh, sharing information, opinions, some experience in the chat box. And we had lots of right. fun there. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, of course, there were some uh, questions, some comments, whatever. There is one, I don't know whether uh, you have anything related to that. Azra Hojam asks if you can suggest a, a good way of preparing rubrics for teaching online. Right. Is there any site that you can recommend or any rubrics that we can use for? Yeah, she mentions online, especially online teaching. Right, teaching speaking online or teaching anything online. I suppose teaching speaking online. Uh, I guess speaking, yeah, right. your topic is speaking, so. Right, uh, I mean, I don't remember a particular one uh, you see by heart, but how I work with rubrics is I focus on, the, on each task sort of separately because each task, each assignment re requires a different type of uh, rubric because it mm. has a different objective, a different mm -hmm. purpose, and the things that you focus on and the things you prioritize are different. So uh, for online teaching, um, I, I'm afraid I don't have something, but it's definitely something that I should think about. Thank you very mm -hmm. much for this command, right? Uh, well, maybe we can Google it and... Uh... Uh, definitely we will come up with uh, lots of uh, sites. Well, Google is a, a very good source, uh, but not always the best to give the answers. So, <laughs> of course, you will end up with thousands of suggestions, but you have to go through and, of course, uh, human touch should right. be there. I mean, you cannot just leave it to, I know people are so crazy about artificial intelligence ai oh you know chat gpt whatever <laughs> no 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 human touch is the answer okay right. you can never trust these machines never i agree i agree yeah. Ojam. Human uh, touch is always important yeah of course uh there are people thanking you thank uh, you very much, for everybody. this wonderful presentation informative a brilliant, oh my God, there are lots of C adjectives. <laughs> Thank you very much to everybody, okay, for their great ideas. Uh, I, I okay. would like to add something here. Uh, the reason why I kept saying YouTube videos, I know that there are some very, very dangerous YouTube videos, but YouTube somehow uh, adjusted its guidelines so uh, it is very picky nowadays so mm -hmm. if there is a, a kind of a scene that is 
harmful, you are warned, you know, that kind of thing. So I love YouTube videos. One, they are short. Two, they show interaction. Mm -hmm. Because we know that communication is rarely all verbal. Most of the time, we have nonverbal communication. You know, between uh, friends, between uh, a mother and a sibling, uh, between, uh, you know, uh, uh, sisters and brothers, uh, between lovers, <laughs> between colleagues. Sometimes one look, one eye roll, one <laughs> smirk, uh, you know, it gives the message perfectly well. You don't need to say anything. Indeed, yeah. Uh, so in those videos, students see them. And uh, as Nurdan Hocam has mentioned, yes, in our English, we have lots of Turkish influence. I have seen so many English professors when you offer something, they go like, thank you. <laughs> this gesture right. is typically Turkish. And what is amazing is I have never heard a British speaker or an American speaker saying thank you. They always say no thank you or yes thank you. That's But right. we just go like, thank you. Because <laughs> this means no. No, Indeed. I don't want it. So see, nonverbal communication. Yeah. What? Definitely. Uh, Ezgi Hocam has a question. Would you like yeah. to ask your own question, Ezgi Hocam? Do you want me to read it? Okay, let's read. Ezgi Hocam has run away. What happened? Uh, Hocam, my yeah, internet is very bad. Right. Can you hear okay. me? Yes, yes, we, we can. can hear you. My internet connection is very bad, so if you don't mind, you can read it. Sure, I can. Uh, Sergeant Hocam, I have seen your hand. I'm going to give you the uh, platform, but let me read this question first. What can we uh, start with speaking assessment at higher education level? Most students come from different backgrounds, so a direct oral exam would be putting them under too much pressure. Mm -hmm. What would be best to start with, Hoja? Uh, since listening and speaking go <laughs> hand in hand, I would always start with listening, right? Mm -hmm. I to provide them a lot of input. And apart from that, in order not to put a lot of pressure on the learners, probably I would start with less demanding little tasks, mini tasks, which would be still, you know, oral because... If you are teaching speaking, I think it's a good idea to start with them. But listening would always be a good starting point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, any, and any, then maybe anything. it will yeah. become the input for the learner and then they can Indeed. respond to that. Uh, maybe, uh, it's good, Jam, if you have a kind of, an, uh, kind of a proficiency exam, maybe you mm -hmm. group your students accordingly. And they have, I mean, you have a, uh, maybe not a very clear cut uh, category, but at least you will know A1 level, A2 level, B1, B2, you know, you would know the category. And then if you can refer to the common European framework, framework of reference, uh, you can use those Uh, objectives, you know, can do statements as mm -hmm. your exam questions, because it says, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the learner can introduce themselves, you know, that kind of thing. Maybe you can say, can you introduce yourself? You know, mm -hmm. so, so common European framework, CFR is a wonderful source that you can mm -hmm. implement But of course, you need to know the level of the students and mm -hmm. you need to refer to the speaking component of CFR, uh, definitely. Uh, yes, Sergeant Ojam, it's your turn now. Please go Thank ahead. You. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, for this amazing uh, presentation, uh, Nurdan Hocam and the other teachers. And I have just met this uh, actually uh, group and I've been following this group. So I'm very uh, lucky, I guess. <laughs> I have been teaching to adults actually. And um, I have been teaching to adults for over six years. And that's why my actually interest is mainly that area. They mm -hmm. have traumas. They have horrible traumas and mm -hmm. the anxiety mm -hmm. slides. I was simply naming my students and I was trying to uh, recall those moments and how I was trying to uh, help them and let's say try to uh, tell them please keep calm and um do we have enough tools during speaking uh, or during teaching how to speak uh, in the class um how to say our students to keep calm i mean we are teaching grammar we are teaching listening we are teaching uh, elements but uh, how about the um how about these tools how to make them feel more comfortable about um about expressing their feelings expressing their issues mm -hmm. at work or in their life um do you know any books or uh, i don't know resources that combines the psychological and also grammatical uh, aspects together Right. Uh, can I ask you something, Nurda Nojam, before you start? Uh, Sergeant Nojam, when you refer to traumas, are you referring to negative learning experiences? Exactly. Exams. Teach, teach. Exams. Uh, okay. They had some, for example, one of my students quit university because they he failed. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Okay. Nurda Nojam, please go ahead. Right. Thank you very much, Sergeant Nojam. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think not everybody is as lucky as I am in terms of, you know, creating your own content and being more flexible, giving them, you know, this task, that, that task and leading this discussion and all that. So um, I would I would say it's actually a mixture of all of these things that I had talked about. I know that um, in the institutions that uh, you you work, um, you have very limited time. And if you want to work individually with students, that means you have to, uh, you have to make extra time, you know, from your own time and apart from the sort of class sessions. Um, as I said before, all of these books and videos and songs, and also sharing your own personal experiences is very valuable because we have all, all been there. I mean, we were not born, okay, speaking English greatly or not being anxious about this, not being anxious about that, <laughs> especially uh, if you have studied another language other than English, because when we were learning English, we were learning to teach it. So we always had the pressure, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't feel uh, that much anxious while learning other languages because we're not worried about, you know, getting something wrong or being you know, judged by the other party and all that. So I don't have sort of one particular solution to, to this problem. I know that uh, it takes a lot of time to encourage the students to motivate them back again so that they can forget about all their traumas. Um, we have all been probably traumatized by one or two teachers at one point in our education. <laughs> I'm sure this all this happened to all of us. First day of primary school, the teacher comes to class and says, Nurdan Diline Eşekarız Soksun. Okay, I'm sure it had an impact on my speaking in class <laughs> later yeah. on, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know what to say uh, to this question. It's a very difficult question, but uh, you know, on a very important point. Thank you, Sajjan Ajan. You're welcome. Am I allowed to ask one more? Uh, of course you can, but I would also like to add something here. What I find very, very beneficial is to find uh, Turkish 
funny incorrect translations yes that is my uh you know oh my god i have a huge collection of them like you know <laughs> uh gözleme observation you know that kind of thing when you come together to laugh at something a mistake it gives you this group synergy a an atmosphere where people can trust each other because they are laughing at something else they are not laughing at each okay. other and they are laughing together and you can also find uh short sketches i remember one for example levant kirsha mm -hmm. he starts uh as the uh i can't remember switch uh, is it the switchboard operator i think so and he has to say hello this is associated press but he can never say it so he goes like this is in turkish it's not in english but he has to say associated press so he picks up the phone and says hello <laughs> watching these uh and laughing relaxes people mm. eases that tension Indeed. this is my personal suggestion yeah there is after a while people. after yeah, a while picture. they can you know very slow you can also make mistakes on purpose but realize it very quickly because you're the model aman be careful and then laugh at your own mistake okay uh -huh. so you can you can like you can go like uh what is that uh, hotel uh, there hotel allah beni kahretmesin hotel hotel <laughs> what am i saying you know that kind of thing so see how you're correcting yourself as a model and you're showing that it's always it's okay to make mistakes indeed yes just a, just a suggestion yeah. a your second suggestion. question thank you so much yeah it is it is very helpful for my classes and do i have still time for the second yes 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 you do so active listening is the second question actually again with a similar maybe so i am trying to inform my students about active listening and especially uh, how to form questions during the conversations mm -hmm. we mostly i mean i was taught in primary school in secondary school high school usually to answer the questions but not the ask questions so mm -hmm. i i usually try to encourage my students please your turn and ask me questions and you are going to also lead the conversations lead the meetings not only you are not going to only uh, answer the questions all the time you can't continue the conversations so um do you think that this is kind of a help or it is just uh it's just a theory uh, that i have created what do you think i would like to hear your opinions Uh, thank you for this question. I think active listening is something very important. First of all, it is something that they should practice a lot in their native language as well, because mm -hmm. I think most of the people around us, maybe we're also included, we do suffer from not listening to people actively, because most of us are busy about what you're going to say next. Just listen to what the other person is saying, okay? Nobody is expecting you to perform or, you know, say something immediately. So I'm sure if they learn how to listen to people actively, focusing on what the other person is saying, they can transfer that ability to uh, learning, I mean, to speaking English as well. It's it's very valuable. That That's a great way of doing it. Thank you. Thank you for the information. Thank you. And asking for clarification is uh, a part of natural communication, like I did. You mm -hmm. talked about trauma, and I said, what are you referring to when you say trauma? You know, it is asking for clarification because I don't want to misunderstand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So it is a good model, uh, good modeling for your uh, students, of course. Uh, I think we're done. I cannot see any more hands or any more questions after a very long day. Uh, I know how exhausted you are, how tired you are, but I am so grateful for this wonderful session. Uh, and of course, as usual, my dear colleagues, I am grateful to you guys. You are with us trying to learn, trying to improve yourselves, which is, I believe, the most important thing about being a teacher. It is. Right? Yes. Thank you very so, much, Ujjan, for giving me this opportunity. It was lovely to be here with you and with all the participants. Thanks a lot, everybody, for all the lovely comments and the contributions and the questions. Thanks very much. Hope to see you all again. Thank you very much. Uh, my uh, dear colleagues, I hope to see you next week. Uh, however, because the Bayram holiday is coming, we will not have uh, sessions on Friday before Bayram and during Bayram, of course. So uh, we will have a short break, okay? But we'll be back. You know, Friday nights are so meaningless without me. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ajam. Nurdan Ajam, Aydan Ajam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take good care of yourselves, yourselves, everyone. Take bye -bye, care. Everyone. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.